Hey everybody, it's Josh, and for this week's Select, I've chosen our 2019 episode on the science of breakups. It's just a straight-ahead, interesting episode about people and what makes us tick. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryan over there. There's Jerry. Rush, 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 Jerry. This is Stuff You Should Know, the breakup edition. Right. Three people who have never broken up with one another. No, that's true. The last three. Great point. The modern triad. Yeah. <laughs> the triad. Uh, so I picked this one out because mainly... Um, it uh, this is a refrain we get in email a lot. Um, we hear from heartbroken people a lot. Sure, more than you would think. That are just like lots so of, sad, lots of broken hearts out. And there. you, uh, you guys have helped me with this show mm-hmm. as a distraction, which we will learn is one of the official ways to get over a breakup. Yeah, look over here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so it just got me thinking about like, is there any science behind breakups and the emotions that go along with it and Turns out there's a lot, like a disturbing amount of study has been done. I know. When you look at it, you're like, oh, man, maybe you should have allocated that money toward research toward other things. Yeah, like cancer. Yeah. Although social psychology couldn't do anything about cancer. No, and it's, you know, it's not like they're like, oh, well, we'll just, it's all taken from one big pool. Mm -hmm. So we'll just allocate some of this breakup money toward cancer research. Sure. It's not how it works. Well, you could allocate the money, but the the mental energy, I guess, <laughs> is what I'm talking about. Yeah, but this that was just it seemed like study after study, and mm-hmm. and also uh, we should point out too that I think there was one case in here of one study where they looked at homosexual couples, but most of this study is like cisgendered straight couples. Yeah, uh, through that lens only, they're not doing a ton of research outside that. I found I found one that um uh, that that tracks um it correlates the likelihood of breaking up to time and they had it broken out by same sex and um straight married and unmarried those were like the gotcha. four categories so th- some people are doing it sure but yeah for the most part no and I think one of the reasons why Chuck is <clears throat> a lot of this is from the mid two thousands early two thousand tens yeah. And that was, you know, that was about the last, the last, like the tail end of that. Now I think it's starting to change, fortunately. Right. Because people of all genders and sexual orientation break up and get dumped. And we're here to help all of you. (laughs) So buckle in. (laughs) Grab a hanky and let's get through this. Uh, Yeah, I mean, we should go ahead and start out by saying, I guess, that... um, in theory, more people are breaking up now because people are generally waiting longer to get married. Right. So if you could extrapolate that, if you're not married for 10 more years than, let's say, our parents were. Right. Then maybe you've gone through a couple of more breakups along the way. Yeah, we should give a shout out to Kristen Conger of Unladylike Media. Yeah, Kongs. Who wrote this article. Our old pal. She points out that that typically means that you are going to find somebody who you work with rather than rushing into it. Mm -hmm. But it also, as she puts it, like leaves the window open longer for heartbreak to be dumped. Yeah. One thing I saw, Chuck, this is mind-boggling to me. 85% of people, according to this one study, um, will be dumped in their lifetime, will experience being a breakup in their lifetime. That means 15% of humanity won't. That is, those are some interesting people. Eight, 15% have not had a breakup or been broken up with? Will not in their lifetime. They're oh, okay. just going to either never have a relationship or the first time they're going to hit it out of the park. But that doesn't mean like... Or settle. I've never park. been dumped. Yeah. Like they'll never have gone through a breakup. But I've been through it, breakups. I've done. I've been the dumper. Right. I know what you're saying. No, I believe that they will not have experienced a means. breakup in their lifetime either way. Well, that's great. That means they sure, yeah. They met the person that they love 
when they're young, probably. Again, or it means that they decided to live their life alone, which is fine. Right. Or. Or both. They, like I said, they decided like, yeah, I'm just going to stick with this person. Yeah. I don't want to, I want to be what, (laughs) I don't want to ruin my record. A spotless record. Uh, I think it's very interesting here that um, supposedly, and this is very hinky, how they found this out about the spikes and breakups from like... That's a Facebook data poll. So, social media. That doesn't count social psychology. <laughs> doesn't count. I agree, but th- it does make a little bit of sense, and I could see this being true, that generally b- dumping someone or getting broken up with can happen on any day of the year, but there are spikes in early December and early March yeah. because of Christmas holidays and spring break. Yeah, and technically— I could see that being true. There has, I'm sure it's true, at least on Facebook. And yeah, this is a pretty big data pool, but it's like, that's so lazy. It's lazy, but I could see it because it's it makes a little bit of sense that you would not want to go through the holidays with someone mm-hmm. that— uh, and you sent a thing too, and this is important to point out, like— when the breakup happens, when that talk or these days text message or phone call happens. <laughs> it's not okay. That is the end of something for maybe both of you, but definitely one of you. Yeah. Sometimes, so, most of the time. That that actual act of saying we're breaking up, that's at the end of many, many weeks or even months or even years of contemplation about whether or not you want to still be with this person. Right. And that's why... Being broken up with is almost across the board way harder sure. than breaking up because by the time, like you said, by the time the person who initiates the breakup initiates the breakup, this is at, this is at the end of a long road of decision making. Yeah. Whereas the other person might have been blissfully unaware or at least willfully ignorant um, or not willing to address the issues. Yeah. And so they are one way or another largely caught off guard by being broken up with. So the the person who does the breaking up has already gone through all these stages of grief or of separation, whereas now it's this person, the person who's just been dumped. It's their time to go through it. Right. So if you're if you're doing the dumping, like the hour after you have that conversation, you're like, what a relief. I'm I'm starting over. Let's go get some gin. Whereas the dumpy is like Let's that go just, get some gin. That begins <laughs> That begins their process. Yeah. Although the only thing I'll take issue with that whole line of thought, though, is that a lot of people, even that might get dumped, aren't like, what? Like, they pr- may have known and sure. just didn't want to admit it. Right. Or weren't brave enough or strong enough to do it themselves. Yeah. Um, and I agree with you on that. I think that there's still a thread that they had not been preparing themselves just by being in, say, denial perhaps. or unwilling to address it face it now they have no no choice but to face reality Mm -hmm. whereas the person who did the breakup was like facing reality and coming to terms with it quietly sure and then now it's your turn right which brings me back to my original point which is christmas and spring break make a little bit of sense because Mm -hmm. the person who is desperate to get out of a relationship and break up with somebody they're staring at those christmas holidays and that first week of december rolls around they're like, I got to do this now because I don't want to travel out of town with this person and yeah. go through the whole gift thing. Right. And the holidays are just, it's tough to be in a relationship that's a lie. Well, sure, because the holidays. I mean, the holidays are so about like connecting and feeling yeah. and warmth and all that. And if you're faking it or have to fake it, you know, some people are like, I'm not going through that. No good. I also saw an explanation in Harper's Bazaar of all places <laughs> that some people may do that because of the pressure of coming up with a really good gift. Sure. That the relationship is not worth – the pressure of coming up with a good gift outweighs the value of the relationship to those people. Or there are some people who don't want to put their significant other through that, so they just break up proactively. Right. Which also means that – they didn't value the relationship that much either. But at least in their mind, they're not doing it for themselves. They're yeah. doing it for the other person because they don't want to put the other person through that that pressure of having to get the perfect gift. Yeah, I've never had that thing either where you start dating someone and it's like a couple of weeks before their birthday mm-hmm. or Christmas. And, you're, and then that pressure of like, oh, man, how do I play this one? 
you know, like a couple after a couple of weeks. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. That's, you that's really a like pass. this person, or sure. like, but how do how deep do I go on this gift? Here, I don't really know you, <laughs> so I got you a basket of socks. Everyone loves socks. So here's an Amazon gift card <laughs> for thirty eight fifty. Right. Yeah. After a couple of weeks, that's a little that's a little close. Yeah. I think Come so. up with a perfect gift, or even be expected to. Uh, and I did mention breaking up by text or whatever, uh, like you would suspect, uh, if you were born before 1975, like myself, mm-hmm. um, you break up in person, supposedly, about 74% of the time. Not bad. Uh, post-1984, if you were born less than 50% of the time, you're going to do that in, per- in person. And they say Generation Y, whatever that is. I think it's millennials. Is it? I'm pretty sure. When do they name them? Do, like, do they know what, like, does my daughter have a generation already? I don't know. Like a name? I'm sure somebody out there is named yeah. your daughter's generation. Yes. So annoying. Don't box her in. Right. <laughs> well, you got to pigeonhole folks. <laughs> Let her grow up. Yeah. Be her own person. Uh, but if you are Gen Y, you're more likely 30% to do it over the phone. Uh, and, of course, this says a searing instant message. Uh, or an email, I think these days you would call that a text. An email is the lowest percent-wise and compassion-wise. Four percent of people that's the worst. break up by imagine? email. What was text it on, is uh, pretty bad. Email is as bad as it gets. Was it Sex in the City where it was a sticky note? No, I don't remember. I feel like that was a in sticky note In the movie or breakup. the show? I didn't see the movie. Sticky note breakup. I think so. Um should we take a break? Yeah, let's take a break, man. All right. This is going really, really well so far. Okay. All right, Chuck. So we've talked about when people break up, how they break up, why do they break up? Well, actually, there's one more. <laughs> oh, okay. I think pretty important thing about the how, uh, which is men and women. Oh, yeah. Uh, women tend to present, a, and this sort of makes sense too, if you want to be stereotypically, you know, stereotypical <laughs> about it. Uh, women tend to present a list of grievances. Here's like, all the things wrong with you, Bob. Pretty much. Whereas men, uh, it's a little more, uh, supposedly a little more nebulous. Where'd the magic go? Yeah, there you go. That's apparently the difference is as far as like rationale for breaking up. And these are so macro level and broad. Right. And how we talk about it, it's a little embarrassing to even do. To talk about this stuff? Yeah. I like, know. I, I men was, do this and women do this. Right. No, it's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, that's... But I feel like when you talk about this, people can find themselves in the contours of I think so. Of all, if you put all this stuff together, yeah. If you just took one study and said that this was definitive, people should should punch you in the kidney. Agreed. But not really. Don't punch anybody. You know, everyone. Over the last almost eleven years of stuff, you should know. I've said a lot of things that make it sound like I'm inciting people to violence. Friendly violence, though. I was joking every single. Time. Why? Someone said something? Or no, you just, I just I just sure. want to make sure that everyone knows that I was never, ever actually serious in saying hit somebody in the head with a tack hammer. Yeah, yeah. You, or punch someone in the you kidney. You do that a lot, actually. <laughs> I'm kidding all the time. Except for when you recommend that you pants somebody in front I of— I was kidding even then, too. In front too. of a classroom or— That's psychological abuse. <laughs> it is. It's physical, but it's more psychological than anything. You ever been pantsed in front of people? Yes. Really? Yes, and I can tell you it's psychological abuse. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been pantsed. Boy, I can't imagine anything more horrifying than being pantsed What's, without underwear on. Well, I can confirm that because <laughs> I can't remember being pantsed. I just remember that I have been pants. So I think I just immediately blocked out everything. Sure. Yeah. So no story no story there. No. Um <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, so if you get broken up with, um, you will feel, and we're going to talk about the science of a lot of this because it's very similar to overcoming addiction sometimes, but, um, of course, depression and anxiety, 
Uh, sometimes suicidal thoughts. Sometimes homicide. Oh, sure. That's a that's an outcome, a, a worst case outcome, that and suicide of, of breakups. But it, they are directly related to breakups. That's how bad breakups can be. Yeah. Uh, and apparently, you know, when people do write in about getting uh, dumped and stuff, I always say, you know, it's the most trite thing in the world, but like time is the only thing that really helps. Yeah. Like ice cream and stuff like that is good, mm-hmm. but like it really does uh, – Decrease over time. However, in studies, um, eight weeks after being dumped, in this study, 40% of people still had signs of clinical depression and 12% appeared moderately or severely depressed. Yeah. So it, it depends on the relationship, how long you're in it, how much it meant to you, what kind of person you are, but it, it can stick around for a, for a bit. It can. So um, the thing is, though, there are things you can do to help accelerate the healing process. And we'll talk about those at the end. How about that? Okay. We'll make y'all wait. All right. So um, where are we at, Chuck? Are we at the... the? Uh... Well, the attachment styles, I think, is interesting because oh, yeah. um, we did talk about, like, gay, straight, cisgendered, uh, you know, on the gender spectrum. Mm-hmm. Maybe none of that matters. Uh, maybe what matters is what they call your attachment style. That's That's what this says pretty plainly that yeah, like, like, that's what it comes down to. How you attach yourselves to other people. You can be a needy, clingy dude. You sure. can be um, a uh, avoidant woman. Yeah. Or you can be either one of those things anywhere on the gender spectrum. That's the thing. Like the, the idea that women are clingy and men are distant is is fabled. Yeah. Or I it's mean, at least ham-fisted. Yeah, I think so. It's It's sort of that thing in social science that bothers me, which is like you're either this or this. Right. Like one thing or the other. And really, all you are is a white college student. That's what they really mean. <laughs> yeah. Who had a little time on their hands. Right. And needed extra credit. Uh, but there are two, uh, supposedly, again, two things, um, attachment styles, anxious attachment and avoidant well, attachment. Conger points out, like, that's two ends of a spectrum. Oh, okay. And you can that fall somewhere sense. on there. There's actually a, it's pretty straightforward. It's um, uh, the O. OIS, I believe, or OSI. It's a scale w- where you pick how your relationship uh, is best described by a series of Venn diagrams. And one circle is you, and one circle is your significant other. Mm-hmm. And they're just increasingly together from just barely touching to almost completely merged into one single circle. Mm-hmm. And you just circle the one that best describes your your sense of what your relationship's like, and that supposedly gets your your uh, spectrum replacement on the spectrum of attachment across. Oh, interesting. So it's real subjective and self-reported, so that is to say not scientific. Right, unfortunately. <clears throat> um, supposedly, two-thirds of women initiate divorces uh, and in this article, it says that might give them a statistical edge over getting over a relationship. Because they initiated the breakup, so they've been in the process already. Maybe. That's what I think she meant. I think so. I'm just not so sure that just because a woman initiates a divorce, it may have been after years of uh, systematic abuse, you know? Right. Which may not mean, like, she's so ready to get over this mm-hmm. uh, quicker than he might be. Right. You know? Yeah, no, I mean, you can't just say, it, like, if X, then Y right? with this stuff. It's relationships. They're as messy as, as humans get. It's a relationship. Yeah. That's all you need to say. <laughs> well, let's talk about the brain a little bit, because this is where it does get a little more interesting, I think. And okay. slightly Thank more God. Sci- slightly more scientific. Okay. Uh, there was a study in 2011 um, by neurologists at the Einstein College of Medicine, which sounded totally fake. Totally. <laughs> but it's I, not. <laughs> I have sounds made up written down. It's in the Bronx. Yeah, there's also— Reputable. There were also anthropologists from Rutgers and SUNY to legitimize things Oh, I w- in this study. If Rutgers is legitimizing things, then sure. we're in trouble. Oh, really? <laughs> is that is that really— I thought Rutgers was all right. Or am I confusing it with Tufts? Uh, you're probably thinking Princeton. Oh, okay. Both New Jersey schools. I thought Rutgers was the public Ivy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Rutgers, I tried. I can't I'll, wait I'll send to hear your from check back. them. They're going to be so mad at me. I've hung out at Rutgers. I've been there, people. So you know what you're talking about. I know exactly what I'm talking about. Is it about. like the Detroit of New Jersey colleges or something? Mm, 
That's not untrue. Okay. All right. He don't disagree. <laughs> Boy, we're going to get killed. <laughs> That's okay. So this study from Einstein College of Medicine found that just looking at a photograph uh, of an ex-partner caused um, the second uh, somo somatosensory cortex in the dors dorsal posterior insula. Nice. Jeez. Uh, and these areas process physical discomfort. They start lighting up. The same thing as happens is when you get physically injured, basically. Right. Like you are in actual legitimate pain as far as your brain is concerned in the midst of a breakup, at least when you're stuck in an MRI machine and shown a picture of your recent ex. Which is a big deal now with social media because every modern article I read about breakups and getting over them talked about what a deleterious effect social media will have on your recovery process. Are you taunting me? <laughs> Because this stuff's everywhere now. It used to be easy. You could just throw everything in a shoebox mm -hmm. and set it on fire, set it on fire <laughs> and send it down a river yeah. in a little boat made of rage. Sure. Um, but you can't do that anymore because they're everywhere. No, but that's, that's tip number one from psychologist Guy Winch, author of How to Fix a Broken Heart. <laughs> Stay the H off of social media. Do not yeah. stalk your ex on social. Do not check in. Like, just separate. I imagine that would be really hard because in the old days, it was just left to your imagination to think about how much fun they were having mm -hmm. with, you know. Now you can see the, pictures of <laughs> the nine new boyfriends that sure. she has. Right. Um, but yeah, you're right. now, Or, or you know, maybe it helps some I, people. I don't I know. Don't I think it's imperative that you not do that to help. Okay. To help. Like, it's not like Watching them on social media will prevent you from ever getting over it. I think no matter what you do, you're going to eventually get past this. Sure. But all you're doing is prolonging the process and that's uh, like unnecessarily. Yeah. Uh, and then also when you were on the um, fMRI machine and they did brain scans from people who had been broken up with recently, they found that it very much similar to people overcoming like an addiction to cocaine – uh, and that that same circuitry is of overcoming addiction is just lighting up. It's that potent. Yeah. So, so far what this MRI study from Albert Einstein came up with is that you are in physical pain from the breakup. Uh -huh. And you're the same centers that are activated by addiction cravings, withdrawals, are activated by the breakup as well. That's astounding. Yeah, and this weird mental cycle happens basically when you do look at like a photograph of a uh, – what they say, a former lover. <laughs> right. <laughs> lover. Like the Burger King laying on a rug, <laughs> bearskin rug. But you'll you'll see the photo, and the weird thing is you'll immediately get a, a reward. You will get a dopamine hit, uh -huh. like a pleasurable feeling by right. seeing this person that and you love. And then loved. you realize, oh, wait. Well, then you get sad. All right. Immediately afterward. Uh, and then that sadness, uh, sadness. <laughs> Where did that come from? It is a little saggy feeling. That triggers uh, the brain's ventral uh, tegmental area and the nucleus uh, acumen bins. Acumen bins? I think so. I know we've run into that before. We used to talk about the brain a lot more. Acumen bins. Acum I think we figured Acumens. out the brain though, right? So we stopped. Yeah. We were like, it's done. Um, but the, these two things working together, regardless of how I mispronounce them... <laughs> Uh, they trigger the urge to see that person. So you get sad, and then your brain lights up in two areas, and they, you go, hey, like, remember that dopamine hit you get from looking at this picture? Why don't you just give them a call and see what's going on? Right. You want the real stuff. Go. Go That's get right. them. They also, those two areas apparently also um, are analytical as well. So they're responsible for rehashing the uh, the relationship. But – Apparently, they're not very realistic because most people, when rehashing the relationship, highlight the good parts and forget about all the bad parts. I kind of have tended to do that. I think everybody does. I, I don't understand why. I don't know. I don't agree with that. Like, <clears throat> Emily, and we, we, of course, been married so long, this subject never comes up anymore. Mm -hmm. But I was always like, oh, with the old girlfriend, what was so bad there? And then if I really thought about it, I would remember where she's always like, oh, that was awful. Oh, really? Yeah. Gotcha. Well, she's smart. 
Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> and I'm a dumb dumb, so that but, all makes the, sense. but okay, so even and you're not a dumb dumb. Even if um like you represent a third of people or a half of people mm-hmm. who do re- when rehashing only think about the good stuff and forget about all the negative stuff. Like, what is that? Why does that even mm-hmm. happen? It's bizarre if you think it's about it. a personality thing. Well, like if I tend to be optimistic maybe or. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's a pretty good explanation to tell you the truth. What I was going to say is if you look at relationships or romantic love. Sure. As um, a, a, a evolutionary drive to pair and mate sure. successfully over and over again mm-hmm. and to stay together, that would bring you back to this person that you've already oh, yeah. connected with rather than making you go look for another mate. That makes sense. So maybe it's kind of like a backstop or a failsafe for breakups, evolutionarily speaking. Right, like I was so close to having nine babies. Like, <laughs> do I really want to start all over again? Right, right. Which is funny because that means that Emily's more evolved than you. In <laughs> well, that sense. Yeah, in every sense. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, but the the end of that mental cycle, basically, though, is those areas light up that say, go back and see that person. Then you are immediately unsatisfied in, uh, about the fact that that's not happening. Right. That's when your prefrontal uh, cortex trips into gear, and that's when you get angry. And it's just that mental cycle that starts with seeing that photo on a social media platform right. and ending up uh, upset yep. in the end. But um, the same study led by Helen Fisher found that um, after, over time, the same process is greatly degraded. Sure. I think they did a follow-up in, well, months, Conger says, uh, found that the whole process and and all of the neurochemicals and the brain regions are much less active, which, again, it's just time. Give it time. Right, but if you don't give it time and you do the thing where you do get back together, mm-hmm. uh, that that can be great, you know. it's um, Sometimes you can work it out and people can change. Um, but there's a big caveat there. Well, right, go ahead. No. No, 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 you, you say yours. Okay. Because right. I think I'm talking about something else. So um, what I saw was that if you get back together, rather than saying like, this is a, a fresh start. We're going to try this over again. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to really make a go of it. If you do that, all you're going to do is just walk right back into the same pitfalls and pratfalls because the separation probably did nothing or virtually nothing to your individual personalities, right. which are the source of all of your conflicts. So you, it's not like you just magically worked your conflicts out and you're getting back together and everything's fine. That's just a charade. But if you get back together and say, I decided... I love you the way you are, and I don't want to be away from you, and I, I I just accept you for you, Yeah. and I accept our relationship with all of its problems, you're probably going to have a successful reunion. If you go into it like all of our problems are solved because we broke up, you're just going to do right. the same thing again down the line. And that's apparently a, a fairly frequent thing that <clears throat> something like 60% or some crazy percentage of um, younger the younger generation, Generation Y, I guess, mm-hmm. um, bre- the process of breaking up, the majority of them, uh, that that breakup involves getting back together multiple times. Right, with that Not person. just once, yeah. So yeah. They're, you're getting back together and just going through the same pattern. I think there's a, a field of thought in psychology called scripts. These are scripts right. that we're, we're playing out one another's scripts. And if you don't alter the script, you're going to go through the same script over and over again. Uh, you're you're working out the same things from your past or from your childhood against one another, and you're not doing it in the right way. So all you're doing is creating conflict, and that doesn't just magically go away because you spend right. a couple months apart. You have to just say, "I I love you for who you are," and we're going to just just keep going. Yeah, I think what I was going to say was, um, don't they think though that that also depends on just what kind of person you are in terms of thinking either people can really make substantial change in their lives or they can't. That's how how you deal with a breakup, which we'll talk about in a minute. That sounds like a good place for a break. I think so, too. All right. Before we get to that, 
mm-hmm. what we were just talking about before the split. Um, this is one piece of data um, from the same sex couple community. Uh, supposedly, from studies, they do think that same sex couples are better at staying friends. Yeah, I saw that after a breakup. Yeah, which uh, particularly um, lesbian couples. Yeah, and then gay men. And then straight couples are like, forget about it. So long. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. Can you really be friends after? And it all depends on how intense mm-hmm. and how long and and how kind of a person you are. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's interesting when I meet people that legitimately are friends with people that they seriously dated years later. It's pretty rare, I think, actually. I think, I think it is too. I think it seems less rare because it, you see it on like, TV shows a lot. Right. You know? Um, and it's also almost aspirational. Like, oh, look at how, like, how laid back and, like, with it these people are that they can be friends yeah. after this, you know? Um, I think it's pretty rare, actually. I think it's an idealized form. Right. Because or, people like to—you I you like to think that, like, you're on good terms with everybody in your life. I think that's usually the person breaking up, though. There's like, I'd like to still be friends. Right, sure. Whereas the person getting broken up with is like, or Never. you could get hit by a car. Right, yeah. And that would solve the problem. Yeah. Um, and then sticking with the whole same-sex straight thing— it, it, are we saying straight still? I don't know. That doesn't feel right, does it? Uh, it doesn't. So let's just say same sex and hetero. Yeah, hetero. There's a there's a clinical name for it. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> um, so uh, the the time and marriage seem to be the two greatest indicators, at least as far as this one study I saw mm-hmm. went, um, for the likelihood of staying together over long periods of time. Right. Like all relationships, same sex and hetero, um, man, woman, uh, all of them are in at the greatest risk of breakup within the first year or two. Right. And then it starts to drop precipitously. But I think married s- hetero couples have a fairly low rate of a, a low chance of breaking up over time. It's pretty much flat the whole time. Mm-hmm. Um, say, and then with same sex couples, the, the same thing happens. It, the chance of breakup is pretty high at the beginning, and then it starts to come down. And then it's basically tracks with hetero couples for marriage. So marriage is kind of the factor. Mm-hmm. Time is the second factor. But then time stops being a factor after like 30, 40 years for unmarried couples, both hetero and same sex. They start to break up after you're like 30 or 40. Like the really? chance of a breakup increases. Yeah. <laughs> but once you get married, once you get a ring on it, uh-huh. um, over time, over like, you know, decades is what we're talking about, your chance is almost nil of of breaking up. All right. Like less than I think a percent. Huh. But that doesn't sound right because don't, don't like half of all marriages end in divorce? Yeah. Well, this thing was way off. But maybe that's when taking into account, maybe that's front loaded by right. all the divorces that happen in the first five years or right. something like that. Yeah. That, okay. That would make a little bit more sense. Yeah, it does. Uh, they do find that your chances of getting over a breakup or adjusting to that new post breakup life mm-hmm. um, really centers around regaining your sense of self. Um, that when you couple up with someone, uh, it's not saying you can't have a sense of self anymore because it's very healthy to. Sure. But there's an, an inevitable um, absorption and morphing that happens. And a little bit of your sense of self goes away when you couple. Yeah. All the same friends, the same phone number. Yeah. And the same address. Yeah. Boy, what about couples that share the email address? Yeah. You mean I have one? Really? Sure. Never had one. But you have your own too. Well, yeah, we each have our own, but we have our shared one too. I think I'm talking about the people that just have the shared address. Sure. I've always found that interesting. Yeah. Not I'm judging. I don't know anybody who just has a shared address. I don't get why people would have the same one, I guess. I just always, Emily still has a MindSpring address. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Is it Emily at MindSpring.com? <laughs> no. And that is the truth because I'm not saying that just to keep people from emailing her. Uh-huh. But uh, she's she had it for so long and I make fun of her all the time. Sure. She still pays like twenty dollars a year for this. What? <laughs> and she was like, "I've had it for so long that I just can't give it up." Like, well, that's why people stay on Facebook. Yeah, like I'm not changing my email address. There's like so many years memories in. there. That it's like, well, I'm even stuck. that, just her contact list and every email. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I just think it's funny. I was like, "Where's that money going?" 
Right. I guess who owns to what used Todd to be Mindspring, the heir of the Mindspring <laughs> fortune? He can count on 20 bucks a month He's from a your house. a pack of cigarettes every month <laughs> <laughs> because of Emily. Yep. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> and then for recovery, uh, the, the whole stress-related growth thing that can happen with recovery, which is, um, and I think women tend to be more apt to do this than men, but mm-hmm. like, all right, you know what? I'm free now. I'm going to do all those things that I lost while I was with him. Right. I didn't have time for my friends anymore. I lost connections with them. I didn't do, I didn't fly model airplanes or RC (laughs) airplanes anymore. I'm going to drop some weight. I'm going to start eating healthier. The post breakup weight loss is a huge, huge thing. It is. And partially from stress, but partially just because like, I'm going to make myself the best I can be. And and I'll show her or him. I think it's also like, um, just as simple as like more free time. Sure. You know, too. And something to do that is, you know, exercise is also stress relieving. Mm-hmm. Um, you might not be eating as much because your stomach is tied up into stress knots. Right. So there are a bunch of reasons for it. But here is that, here's where that um, that part you were talking about earlier I said we would get to kind of kicks in, is how much of the self you identify with mm-hmm. Um does relate to how well you handle a breakup. How yeah. much of your, how much of the you is the we mm-hmm. in the relationship? Yeah. And what they found is that that's a huge part of it, but more significant is the amount of growth that happens while you're in a relationship. Like you can share a tremendous amount of the same self with your significant other and grow as a person as a result. And if you do that, um, you're actually going to have a harder breakup. Because yeah. that we, that that super attachment um, that led to that personal growth is related to that other person who's now gone. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you were, you even if you were totally enmeshed with another person, but you didn't grow much personally, if you experience a burst of growth after the breakup, mm-hmm. you're going to have the easiest breakup of all. Even though you were super enmeshed with the person, right. you weren't growing, but then you grow afterward— now, that period of non-growth is related to that person who's gone, and mm-hmm. you can be like, so long, Zero, I'm going to make myself a hero. <laughs> yeah. Do you see? Sure. Did that come across? Yeah. Because sometimes I'm not the best at explaining things. Which is pretty funny, if you think about it. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> um, in 2000, they did a study at Northwestern University uh, where they did find out, though, that um, they asked people, I believe, how bad do you think this breakup is going to be yeah. if you, if you, you know, you're in a relationship, what if you broke up? And then they found out <laughs> that they, they weren't as bad off as they thought they would be, which well, is encouraging. It is. But also think about this, Chuck, these vultures who are yeah. running the study <laughs> were like, you're in a relationship. Just, just, we're going to study just in case you guys break up. Yeah. And so they they would get that info, that self-reporting info about how bad the breakup would be. And then they swooped in upon the breakup. They're like, how bad is it? Yeah. Tell us. And the, the, the person was like, well, this is as bad as it is. And it was almost across the board. Yeah. Not, not anywhere near as bad as the people thought it would be right. when they were in the relationship. Yeah. Which is pretty surprising. And what was even more surprising is the more in love you are, the easier it's going to be relative to how bad you think it will be during the relationship. Right. Which makes sense if you stop and think about it. Yeah, I thought the other interesting thing, too, when we were talking about um, getting over uh, a breakup and your sense of self, uh, that's closely tied to how you feel about rejection. And um, there are a couple of, I mean, more than a couple of ways, but if your reflection of your how you think about rejection is tied heavily into how you feel about yourself. So right. there's some people that might be rejected and it might devastate them because they start to analyze themselves and mm-hmm. what did I do wrong and what's mm-hmm. wrong with me. Right. But there's a whole other camp out there and I think this goes into personality and ego and all that stuff, but you call these people healthy <laughs> or sociopaths. Oh, you think so? Maybe. Oh, it's, I it's probably it to on be a healthy. range. Wow. <laughs> I just <laughs> we just put both of our cards on the table, didn't we? But the people that are like, "Yeah, I got broken up with, and I, but, and I got rejected." But you know, S happens. That happens in life. People get rejected. It's not because of me. 
I just thought, not everyone, uh, you know, so you find, can be together. So you find this quote sociopathic. I learned that two people can both be quality individuals, but that doesn't mean they belong together. That's <laughs> sociopathic to you? That's, that was, oh, wait, it says who said that. It was Ted Bundy. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick Bateman? No, no, no. I don't think it necessarily means you're a sociopath, but I think a, someone with that is a true sociopath would probably be way more w- apt to be like, oh, yeah, well. It was them, not me. Yeah, it's like, it's fine. I, People I see your just point. break up. There's a, sub, a subgroup to that sociopath, as you call it, camp. And they are like, well, breakups happen. Um, I heard what the other person said, and there's some things I feel like I need to work on. Like, say, I was... A terrible communicator. So I'm going to work on becoming a better communicator Those are as a result. People. That's called stress-related growth Yeah, is what that's called, where you're growing out of this horrific experience. Um, and that's healthy. That's super healthy. Yeah. Uh, but they, they, the key is what's unhealthy is to say this was all because of some fatal flaw that I have. Right. That's part of my personality that I'll never be able to get rid of. And so all I'm going to do is poison every relationship from here on out. Uh-huh. And I'm just going to build walls and keep everybody at a distance. And yeah. that's what some people do yeah. as a result of a breakup. And you can't do that. Even if your brain starts to go that way, this research says, stop it. Don't. You have to disassociate yourself. Mm-hmm. Become the sociopath, I guess, if need be, <laughs> to say this is not because of an inherent flaw in me that's right. uncorrectable. Even if the person was right, even if they're like, you're a terrible communicator and you uh, have serious mommy issues, that doesn't mean that you will always be a terrible communicator with serious mommy issues. Yeah. You could work on those post-breakup and become a much better SO to the next person or whatever. Mm-hmm. The key is not not being a fatalist, like there's nothing you can do to change. Right. And then also you should evaluate whether the person was saying that in anger, sure. how much faith you put in their opinion of you. There's a lot of factors that you need to take into account before you take on that kind of thing that just puts you in the bottom of a well Yeah, where you could conceivably hang out for the rest of your life if you're not careful Yeah, without copious amounts of therapy. Yeah, agreed. Or turning to drugs and alcohol, which is a big... Gin. Yeah, big thing that a lot of people do. Gin cuts both ways. Uh, should we talk about some of these tips from this guy? From psychologist Guy Winch. Remember, number one is um, don't check up on them on social media. Good luck with that. Here's why. He says that this will reinforce your ex's presence in your mind and will make it harder for you to stop fantasizing about your broken relationship. You're basically just like literally keeping them right there in front of your face right. through social media. Yeah which is why it's a bad idea. Two. Number two, avoid creating mysteries about why the breakup happened. Uh, and again, this is along those same lines of just keeping your ex like forefront in your mind, mm-hmm. which is hard. I mean, it's going to take a little while. Sure. It, it's, no one says expects avoid. you the next day to pop up and just be like, well, they're out of my mind. That's sociopathic. Yeah. Even if you're the breaker-upper, um, you know, it doesn't mean that you don't have a process to go through as well. Sure. You know? But that's why he says avoid creating mysteries. Like, it's it's probably going to happen, but, like, be mindful when it's going on and be like, enough. Right. I'm going to go work out. Yeah. Or go drink some gin. <laughs> or both. Uh, number three, make a list of all the comp. Oh, this is a good one. Make a list of all the compromises that you had to make <laughs> that you don't want to make again. Start to think about, like, yeah, you know, when I was with this person, I felt like I could never really. Yeah. Be, have my real sense of humor out in public because right. they thought it was loud. That counters that that um, that rehashing that just focuses on the positive. Yeah. It cuts the legs out from under that. Cutting legs. What about number four? Do the things that used to bring you enjoyment is kind of what I was talking about earlier. Even if they don't seem interesting now, that mm-hmm. whole thing where like, geez, I used to really love pottery right, and throwing clay. Sure. And I just, I quit doing it once I started dating Josh. <laughs> yeah. This is me, I'll have this is me no talking. clay throwing <laughs> in my house. Uh, and Josh hated it when Chuck went to the potter's wheel because mm-hmm. it reminded him of Ghost. And Josh hated that movie. So he wouldn't allow me to do it. <laughs> right. But you know what? I'm going to reclaim that pottery wheel. <laughs> yeah. Which is ironic because I was always walking around our house just like Patrick Swayze <laughs> in that scene. But I still hated that movie. <laughs> Oh, 
Um, that was more like the Chris Farley <laughs> Chippendale. Oh, the yeah. Patrick Swayze version. Um, number five, remove reminders. Um, this is the box that you will burn, mm-hmm. which is now just throw your laptop in the fireplace. <laughs> right. And your smartphone. And, and then, like, reconnect with your friends. Like, yeah, you left them in the dust years ago, but they're still alive. And they probably wouldn't mind hearing from you. Yeah, the problem here is is if you you truly do have a mix of friends that you both love. Sure. And it's not like, I didn't leave behind all my old friends. Right. Like, or the worst case scenario is, like, all of my friends are from you. Mm-hmm. Now what do I do? Go down to the YMCA and make <laughs> some new friends. I guess so. Uh, I found this one last study I thought was interesting. The best way to get over a breakup according to science. And this was actually published in the Journal of Experimental Psychology. Uh, and they tested a bunch of strategies for getting over a breakup. Uh, 24 heartbroken people, ages 20 to 37, that had been in at least a two-and-a-half-year relationship. Mm-hmm. So pretty significant. Some were dumpy, some were dumpers. And they said there were three strategies. One is to negatively reappraise your ex. Like, just think about all the bad things. Mm -hmm. Um, The other one was called love reappraisal, which is uh, believe and read statements like, it's okay to love someone I'm no longer with. Mm. Like, it's all right. And then the third was distraction. Literally, the ice cream and and movies trick. The black mirror trick. Uh, And then there was the fourth prompt, which was the control, which was don't think about anything. (laughs) <laughs> Which of course, means you're thinking of the state of marshmallow. Don't Man. think about anything. <laughs> really, just undermine the science yeah. of that study. Clear, clear your brain. So those were the four prompts. Uh, then they showed everyone. They hooked everyone up to an EEG machine. Okay. Showed them photos of their exes. All right. And they measured the intensity of emotion in response to that photo. And then had them use these different prompts to see, like, which one works best. <laughs> when they looked in, the people who were not thinking about anything, they were bleeding out of their eye sockets. They were. Um, and according to the readings, all three, <laughs> all three of the strategies significantly decreased their emotional response to the photos. Really? Uh, relative to the control. Um, if you looked at your ex in a negative light, that first one, like, oh, they were such a jerk. Mm-hmm. You had a decrease in feelings of love, but you left in a worse mood, like uh, that yeah. drudged up bad feelings. Like you you wasted your time or something, I'll bet. Maybe. Or just like, uh, just really ticked me off thinking about all that stuff. Right. You know, so now I did this dumb study. Got to go um, throw some clay. That's right. Uh, distraction made, feel, uh, made you feel better overall, um, but did not have much of an effect on how you really felt about them. Okay. You just didn't leave in necessarily a bad mood. You just got ice cream and watched a funny movie. Good enough. Which is fine, but they said that that doesn't do anything long-term to help you recover. Oh, okay. Just like a temporary whatever. Does it prolong it, though, do you think? I mean, you know as much as the people conducting this stuff. (laughs) It said it's a a form of avoidance that is shown to reduce the recovery. Oh, okay, so it it would prolong it then. I guess so. Everybody stop eating ice cream (laughs) and watching Black Mirror. Uh, and then love appraisal showed no effect on your mood or how you feel about them, but it did dull the emotional response a little bit. So there was really nothing to do. Doesn't sound like it. I saw a couple more tips. One is you could write a letter that under no circumstances will you ever send. Yeah, that's a good trick. Set Emily it on does fire. That. Not that actually, for love relationships, but right. just like anything bothering her. Mm-hmm. It also really works well for grieving, too. Um, you just write a letter. Sure. Uh, and you can say whatever you want because you know for a fact that the other person will never read it. Dear jerk. You can say whatever you want. Sure. And it's just like a cathartic process that yeah. can help hasten things. And then also, why do sad songs feel so good <sighs> when you're going through a breakup? Why do people seek out sad songs? And the best explanation I saw, the best theory, is that a song is a little capsule of emotion. Mm-hmm. And when you're seeking out a sad song you're confronting the very emotions that you're probably stifling right then. Yeah. And confronting it in such a raw form forces you to express those emotions, i.e. cry. Yeah. And that helps you process them faster because you're you're not pushing them off any longer. You're 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 expressing them, you're sorting through them. Mm. So that's what sad songs make you do. That's why people seek out sad songs when they're down and it actually helps hasten recovery. Lady in red. 
I don't think that's a sad song. You're standing with me. That's the saddest song. You're like sailing, <laughs> takes me away. That uh, uh, sailing by Christopher Cross, Lady in Red, and then um, Dan Fogelberg's saying same old Lang Syne. Right. Three saddest songs. Jerry knows that song. <laughs> Those were two Christopher Cross songs. He's got two of the three saddest. No, songs. Lady in Red's not Christopher Cross. I think it is. No. Oh, five dollars. Jerry, we're all nodding now. Five dollars is on the table. All right. I'll look it up. Well, you guys will find out next episode whether I was right or not. I remember the guy's name. It's Christopher Cross. Oh. Jerry's rarely doing one of her rare speaking parts. She yeah. says Chris Christoph Waltz? That's the actor. You know what's funny is I mistyped something and it changed my search to Lady in Red Wings. Like Red Wing boots. <laughs> boots. I guess. Must be a fetish site. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> Uh, If you want to get in touch with me, Chuck, or Jerry, you can shoot us an email to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.